Today we're going to dive into what's happening in Congress around the crypto markets. I think you guys will like it. We're doing a, a hearing breakdown and we're going to basically distill a lot of hours of footage that you guys love us to do. We'll break it down for you and we have a special guest. So stick around. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. I do want to get started here. I do want to thank our sponsor today. And that, of course, is Coinbase. If you're brand new to crypto, maybe you're just starting your journey, make sure you go over to Coinbase.com and set up your own account. You can get into all sorts of crypto assets over there. Even if you're just wanting to hold your USDC, which is kind of the equivalent of a dollar, if you're brand new, use our link down below. You get 200 bucks in crypto when you start your account. Just for you guys to be aware, maybe you're brand new to the channel and you've never seen some of our playlists. This is one of the playlists that we have compiled over, gosh, hundreds and hundreds of videos around US crypto regulations. Uh, so we have a whole slew of hearing videos, and breakdowns of all sorts of analysis when it comes to the legalization of the blockchain industry. And uh, check it out. It's just, we, we have it on our homepage, just U.S. crypto regulation hearings. You guys can uh, kind of get through some of those and, and get up to speed a little bit. This is what we're going to be talking about today, which of course was a hearing, Decoded DeFi, Breaking Down the Future of Decentralized Finance. A couple of points I want to zoom in here just to show you who was involved in this. So we had Polygon, the policy officer over there, Rebecca, Rebecca Reddick, uh, Amanda Tuminelli, who is the chief legal officer of the DeFi Education Fund. She'll be joining me here in just a second. And then also, I want you to pay close attention to Mark Allen Hayes. He was a senior policy analyst for Americans for Financial Reform. We think this was essentially the anti-crypto army position. So you guys know what I'm talking about. If you're following our channel, there's a lot of people in DC that are not too fond of crypto. Uh, I want to get into a couple of points here, but to give you a framework of this hearing, before we bring Amanda in, I want to play this clip for you. So let's take a look. Existing law assumes that there is some identifiable entity that can take possession of my funds, collect information about my transaction, and even block a trade, but that entity does not exist in DeFi. Seasoned lawyers with decades of regulatory experience cannot give their clients advice with certainty about whether their projects comply with the law. So I would say that the, the very first problem is that the SEC has still never defined what a crypto asset security is, which is a precursor to this entire discussion. Mm -hmm. With the exchange rulemaking, they have swept extremely broadly to catch developers and protocols that have no ability to comply with the rule as they have proposed. It Very helpful. The SEC has swept so broadly in its Exchange Act rulemaking that it's run right into the First Amendment of the Constitution. And if making available a protocol, which is a set of rules, isn't publishing speech, then I don't know what is. So joining me today is Amanda Tuminelli, who is the Chief Legal Officer over at the DeFi Education Fund. Amanda, great to see you. Great to see you too. Thank you for having me. So I got a chance to see, that was you on the front of that clip right there. You got a chance to kind of go out there and, and make your way at Congress. Uh, first, I'm just kind of curious, how was the experience there with Congress yesterday or this week? Um, I, look, it was an absolutely huge moment for DeFi, and I was happy to be a part of it. And I have to say, it honestly went better than I expected. Um, okay. the members of Congress, yeah, the members of Congress engaged, right? Like, there was actually um, some really good questions, um, and I could not have been more honored to sit next to the people I was sitting next to, like you mentioned, Rebecca and Peter and Brian. I want to play a clip for you. This is Mark Allen Hayes. Uh, kind of framing up a position that I want to get your opinion on. Let's go to that clip. Unfortunately, the crypto industry is highly volatile, scam-laden, and frequently predatory, which exposes investors to substantial financial losses. In effect, if you have the Howey case, but instead of oranges, you have crypto, uh, is that a security? Uh, thank you, Congressman. The, the Howey test is designed for, to answer the question you've just raised, and it's designed to be tested broadly to apply to lots of different facts and circumstances. And so I'd argue it's an applicable test to the situation. It doesn't have the full benefits of decentralization. Is that what you've found? The research we've seen suggests that, and much of that is industry research or outside observers. Taking a position against crypto, many of those like Mr. Sherman, et cetera, we've seen, and they've been on our show many times as far as clips, how was your take on that? What was the rest of Congress? How did you read the room when you were seeing those exchanges happen? 
So I think the majority of the representatives that were there were actually um, asking good, curious questions about the benefits of decentralized finance. And we did see a couple of uh, members asking questions that were very critical, as you just showed in the clip. Yeah. But I and, and I understand that that typically breaks down on party lines. But I will say that Wiley Nickel, a Democrat, asked a really positive uh, framed question about the benefits of DeFi. And we saw members like Chairman Hill um, and um, uh, others asking questions that were truly trying to get at the positive value of DeFi in society. Mark Allen Hayes was talking about, this is the Americans for Financial Reform category or, or some of the research that he, he was referencing and a couple of statements in here. This was talking about the FIT bill, uh, which would weaken consumer uh, and investor protections for both traditional and crypto. Uh, we've already started to see a lot of pressure now with the SEC where they've even backed off of the term that's being used. Uh, and I think uh, that, of course, has, has kind of con gone on into a position now where uh, they themselves are actually doing apology tours, it feels like, uh, at least. So when you look at that and the framework that we've seen around DeFi, what is, what is it that you're most concerned with right now? So yeah, I think you're alluding to the uh, Binance, the motion for amended complaint that was filed um, last night, I think it was. And yep. in that we saw the SEC completely back off the position that they have consistently taken, contrary to their footnote, um, mm -hmm. that crypto asset securities, the tokens themselves are securities, but they've never defined it. And I would say in response to everything you just asked about, the biggest uncertainty, the biggest problems in things that uh, Mr. Hayes was talking about, consumer protection, issues with scams or exploits, the, the biggest issue underlying that is the lack of regulatory certainty. And that is something that Congress can fix. That is something that the SEC could fix themselves. Um, unlike their footnote, they actually have never given the industry proactive, forward-looking guidance. And the, the easiest way to see that is their lack of a definition of a crypto asset security and them now backing away from the statements they have made in multiple enforcement actions over the past eight to nine years, if not the past decade, um, where they have consistently just said the, this, the tokens themselves are securities in some yeah. and some substance. And I want to play a clip because this is Maxine Waters. And this get, will get to my point of that seems to be still confusion even when you think about the SEC, confused about how to even reference the, the asset, if we want to call it that. Uh, but this is Maxine Waters on crypto hacks. Take a look. It has become increasingly evident that these features have made DeFi most attractive to illicit actors. Which is why Putin and Iran have embraced crypto and, and, uncrypt, and, and, and unhosted wallets. Bad actors took advantage of the opportunity to scam Potential users, Laura Trump and Tiffany Trump's ex accounts were hacked and scammers used them to announce links to a coin falsely claiming to represent World Liberty Financial. And approximately 2,000 people purchased 1.8 million worth of the fake token. Lawmakers have a responsibility here. I think the simplest way to answer your question is that regulators can, should continue to do what they're doing. All right, so again, confusion on the difference between a Twitter hack and a hack, I guess, within the blockchain, which is this could happen with any kind of scenario. Obviously, we all know blockchain is one of the most tracked elements out there as an open ledger, so even within DeFi. So their statements still need to be kind of, I guess, educated to a certain extent. Do you feel like Congress was in a position that they actually knew what they were talking about in terms of asking the questions? Or is it the staffers just feeding them questions? I'm always wondering if we're really getting real analysis to be able to make decisions. I think it's a little of both. Depends on uh, which member of Congress we're talking about. I think that there is this resistance to new technology because it's maybe uh, appears to be really hard to understand, right? It appears right. to be something that's really difficult to engage with. And that's why we at DEF do what we do, which is try to educate members of Congress about the technology itself. But the theme you see in the questions that you just played is this over-focus on crime, hacks, and exploits, as yeah. if 
that was somehow unique to digital assets or DeFi. Mm -hmm. When, as we all know, right, statistically, there's actually much more crime hacks and exploits in traditional finance. And I think the DeFi community and the digital asset community has actually done a lot to itself try to make it easier for law enforcement, right, to trace, like the blockchain forensics firms. Yep. And now there's crypto ISACs that will even get involved when there's an ongoing hacker exploit and assist the protocol or the developers with trying to either unwind the exploit or get get money back to victims. Right. So I think the industry is actually doing a lot. And they're, if you just listen to their questions, you would not know from their questions that actually they are just, uh, there's outsized focus on that compared to how much crime and exploits are actually happening. Well, and it seems to me, even though I've heard uh, time and time in these hearings where uh, crypto experts, blockchain experts, finance experts have all corrected Congress saying, listen, the bad guys aren't going to use something that can be easily tracked on an open blockchain like what, you know, everything out there, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, uh, or even if you're going into DeFi to a certain extent, there's a lot more traceability there than there is on any traditional finance system. We'll talk about that in a second. I want to go over to another clip. This was uh, Mr. Foster talking a little bit about surveillance and control. I wanted to get your opinion. Take a look. How do you identify and how do you um, effectively ban bad actors? Or is there no such concept as bad actors in DeFi? Uh, our fund actually has invested in a company that is building what's called zero knowledge proof protocols. That yeah, but allow that's not what's there right now. It's not ready for prime time. Um, and with the technology that exists today, how do you do it? This particular company has, has launched a product. It's actually being used in the marketplace now. So and, and there's also fundamental problems with the zero knowledge boost use. You know, I've looked at the mathematics behind there. I mm -hmm. program blockchain. And um, if you ever would like to learn how to program blockchain, I would be happy to teach you. How do you implement identification and banning of bad actors in an anonymous uh, self-hosted situation? Law enforcement and blockchain analytics tools are actually able to trace a lot of this very transparently. And you need, a lot isn't enough. You need to be able to trace all of it, and that's, I don't believe, technically possible. So 100% surveillance and control is kind of what he's talking about there. Uh, obviously impossible in any, in any system, much less, but if blockchain were, were going to get into it. I was kind of uh, intrigued with his statement there that he is, he's a blockchain programmer. I did not know that. Mr. Foster, yes. a blockchain programmer? I'm gonna have to look at his um, LinkedIn. We need developers allegedly. in this industry. What's he doing? <laughs> What's he doing at Capitol Hill? We need we need like some solidity developers, and you know Charles Hoskins, and he needs new new developers over there as well. So. I thought Rebecca did a great job in responding to him because he asked, um, you know, he's like, he, he asked questions that I think are smart enough to be dangerous, right? I think he actually really does understand cryptography and he does understand how um, it should work, but he brings, I think, the wrong lens to this. Like, as you mm. pointed out, 100% elimination of illicit activity is just not possible. Nobody tells a bank they can't exist just because exactly. they can't eliminate 100% of criminal activity. Well, you know, you speak of banks, uh, my gosh, here's some criminal activity going on right here at Wells Fargo. Uh, Fargo, uh, of course, getting hit now for money laundering. And this just happened, uh, guess what, today, right after this hearing. So very interesting. This is just the beginning. I mean, we report on banks often that get into this. And of course, we see the traditional financial system being used more so than any uh, within that. Do the do any of the members of Congress ever reference that the amount of nefarious acts that are happening through traditional finance as it is regulated right now today? Yeah, I think Republican members reference it often uh, in digital asset hearings, and I think um, all of the members reference that much more frequently in hearings related to traditional to traditional finance rather than digital assets. It's just that in digital asset hearings, there's this focus on illicit activity instead of the benefits of the technology, and that's what we kept trying to talk about throughout this hearing, which it which is you know why DeFi is great and actually solves a lot of the problems that are inherent in the traditional financial system. Do you feel that the Democrats do recognize what's happening in DeFi almost as protected speech? Well, like freedom of speech. Do you feel like they understand that that is where we're going with this? I'm not sure if they understand where we're going with this. I think Peter Van Valkenburg from Coin Center did a really nice job of articulating the First Amendment argument here. Um, and Coin Center has done a ton of work on that 
and really connected our individual constitutional rights to our uh, to digital assets and the right to publish code. Um, I'm not sure if members of Congress are fully thinking through how that will play out, especially in court cases. Yeah. Um, I think that, as you mentioned, there are members who are very friendly, like Richie Torres and Wiley Nickel, who do get it and have dug in and really taken the time to understand the technology. Would you say that Congress recognizes DeFi, especially self-custody, as personal rights and the ability to do that? There's many states that are, that are now writing laws to protect self-custody wallets. Do you see Congress understanding that that is a grassroots movement that is starting to take hold here in the U.S.? Some of them do. You know, there is the proposed bill, the Keep Your Coins Act, which would um, par- protect the ability of people to use self-custody wallets and developers to create self-custody wallet technology. So there are some members who recognize it, but it's definitely not enough members. I think there um we could certainly benefit from more people understanding that having technology that enables us to make peer-to-peer transactions without an intermediary is what people want and yeah. can be done safely and you know in a way that complies with the law. Well, we do it every day right now with cash. It, that's exactly. a peer-to-peer transaction that is not governed by anything. Obviously, it, we have the same system, so I don't know, understand why we wouldn't see that already. Do you think that there will ever, you as a lawyer and as an attorney, Understanding the blockchain space as you do, do you think there's ever going to be a risk of a requirement for KYC for a personally held wallet at some point? I think that's a non-starter, right? I think that if, I don't even think it's possible to do Mm -hmm. KYC on self-custody wallets. I think you'd have some sort of centralized control there at some point. Right, you'd have to do it on the front end. And I think that that's uh, antithetical to the nature of this technology. We, there is no requirement that peer-to-peer transactions be permissioned, right? That there be a KYC component, just like, as you said, with cash, nobody's collecting information about my cash transactions when I walk to the deli to buy something in cash. So I think that there should not be, we should not lose any rights simply because we have put peer-to-peer transactions on chain as opposed to using cash. Here's Stuart Alderati talking about the SEC finally admitting their position right here on the crypto asset because security, the thing that you're talking about there, made up a uh, term to approve crypto asset security as an investment contract. This pretty much has been put into uh, check now with the SEC having to admit that uh, they're contradicting themselves <laughs> left and right. I mean, what is your opinion right now with the stance of the amount of cases that the SEC has lost? the amount of corrections that are being done with both the CFTC and the SEC by judicial officials, almost losing in every way, except for occasionally they win a small case that they basically just overpowered somebody with legal fees. Do you think we're in a position now with where we are today better than we were, say, a year ago, or do you think we still have a fight on our hands? Oh, I'm I'm optimistic. I think that we are winning and I think we will keep winning. I think that we are definitely in a better position than we were a year ago. There has been a number of pre-enforcement challenges launched by the industry, including my organization. I think we are seeing judges understand the technology at issue. For example, in the Coinbase case, while um, other parts of the opinion were not as great, Judge Fela did recognize that the self-custody wallet application by Coinbase, which is DeFi, was uh, not a broker. Coinbase was not acting as a broker through that technology. And there are other examples of judges really engaging with the nuance of the technology. So I think we're moving in a positive direction. There's still a fight to be had, but that does not mean that we're not going to win the war. I was looking at your statement right here today. Uh, the the uh, DeFi fund uh, sued the SEC. Uh, it has everything to do with airdrops and stopping the SEC's regulation on enforcement uh, crusade. Obviously, we've seen that very active here over the past uh, 18 months uh, with Gary Gensler. What were you guys trying to achieve with this? So very simply, we are trying to get clarity on the law. And since Congress has not yet enacted any new legislation on digital assets, we're appealing to the judicial system. So in our case, our co-plaintiff, Beba, which is a, a retail apparel and accessory company, they have done a free airdrop of their Beba tokens 
and to, to unsuspecting users and to get and Beba has appealed to the court to say please make up a declaratory judgment that our free airdrop of tokens is not mm-hmm. a security transaction and the tokens themselves are not securities and together yeah. we've brought a claim targeting the regulation by enforcement campaign that the SEC has been on and said that that is a violation of the administrative procedures act so asking yeah. the court to declare that that campaign is illegal and beyond the SEC statutory authority. Do you feel like that is, what do you feel like your position is right now? Do you think this would be something that would be a a slam dunk for uh, what you guys are trying to do in terms of uh, a statement from the judge possibly? I mean, I think we have a really strong case. It's definitely early. We filed our complaint and the SEC moved to dismiss last week. So we are gearing up to respond to that, but we feel really good about our chances. Um, And we we think the law is on our side when it comes to free airdrops, especially, right? There's no investment of money. So under the Howey test, it should not be a securities transaction. Yeah, exactly. All right, I wanna get to a couple more clips uh, because there was an interesting one here from Mr. Sherman on tax you know, and the idea of what it might look like. Our audience will like this one. Take a look. What we have here is an effort to liberate billionaires from income taxation. It is, in fact, more difficult to evade taxes when you're using open blockchain networks than using the legacy financial system, which is happy to open shell accounts for you all over the world. I would also add that the IRS has been very, very late in offering clear guidance, and they are the big part of the problem here. Is the IRS proposal workable? No, it is not. You know, for example, right now, I'm sure members of your office have started fantasy football. At the end of the season, the commissioner of your fantasy football league is in a position to know the winnings or loss of any person who participated. That person would be a broker under the IRS's new rule. Even after Congress directed the IRS, the IRS went on a multi-year rulemaking spree where they ultimately tried to even apply these rules to non-custodial intermediaries apart from Coinbase in an effort that will not work We're and will trample time. our constitutional rights. We, we can agree that the government is not helping this process. <laughs> That's the least of the statements that they need to make about that. But listen, there's a lot of tax software out there right now that I think is pretty advanced in being able to go into the blockchain, look at all the transactions, do a result, and give you a result on and that you can report to the IRS. Very easy to do, much like a QuickBooks analysis today, Why doesn't Congress see this as a positive of being able to collect taxes the way they should be able to? Well, some of them do, but my guess is because they haven't used the software that you're describing, right? I think that they, there is a real power in seeing, right? Seeing is believing and um, actually doing the demo with a member of Congress and being like, look, Coinbase has it built right in. If you use Coinbase, there's year-end tax reports in multiple formats that make it really easy for you to file your taxes. And, um, you know, as we pointed out in the hearing, tax obligations are on the individual alone. And this idea that it's like on the industry somehow to make sure that individual people pay their taxes is just not, it's just nonsensical. Um, But as you said, there's a lot of ways that the industry has actually really tried to benefit people and make it easy to file taxes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think this is going to be one of the aha moments at some point down the road. Yeah. Uh, they're going to realize that this is something that they didn't necessarily anticipate. I've got one more clip for you. uh, And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Gensler investigation hearing that's coming up. But let's go to this last clip here. (laughs) um, But I remember there was this great pizza restaurant over on Commonwealth Avenue by BU. They were found to have basically retained virtually every law firm in Boston, and they would hire young lawyers to go make deposits at banks And I get concerned in this DeFi conversation that we're framing this as it's beneficial use. It's really good. It's maybe as good as the pizza uh, that was at this pizza joint. And therefore, we shouldn't have anti-money laundering rules. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Should there be any legal accountability to the creators, the operators, the people maintaining that service? Just yes or no. Should those people have any legal liability? Those who are not decentralized, those who are custodial, have AML laws that apply, and they if should be applied, and they def- should be enforced. If it's against. a DeFi protocol, are you saying that there should? Be, we're saying it's decentralized. An are immutable saying, smart contract that I I'm, transact I'm, with. I'm just asking yes or no. Should they have as somebody an American? Wrote the code? As an American transacting with immutable smart contract, I'm transacting with my own funds. I should not be subject to the bank secrecy. Okay, so you think now, Ms. Tuminelli, you think? I think bad actors should be held liable for the bad conduct that they engage in. 
not the developers, not the people who created the software. It's the bad actors who actually committed the crime. We should go after So them. there should be no liability for the people who created the tool. So in, in my, back to my pizza example. The people made the pizza joint. They used these laws. There should be no liability for them because they're just pizza. They're just pizza producers. If I make a neutral tool that okay. somebody uses to okay. commit crime, um, I should not be held responsible for that person's conduct. Uh, if, that's, that's bizarre. I mean, that's aiding and abetting commission of a felony. But there is no disadvantage to the U.S. economy of not protecting the interests of child traffickers, money launderers, and the North Korean nuclear system. The one point on your pizza example uh, is that the pizza restaurant had individuals who were acting with CMTER. And that's very different Gentlemen's than what's going on here. Gentlemen's time has expired. Yield back. So pretty crazy uh, assumptions there by Mr. Kasten. And, uh, I mean, he was really stretching it out there in terms of the, the likelihood. First of all, I'm kind of curious. You were there. You got a chance to see this all unfold in front of you. How was the rest of Congress responding to that very statement? Because it seemed a little bit far-fetched. Yeah, about as you would expect. I mean, as a former white collar criminal defense lawyer, I assure you that that is not how aiding and abetting a felony actually <laughs> right. works in real life. That is not how accomplice liability works. Um, and I think just even using his own hypothetical, Mr. Kasten's hypothetical means that the people creating pizza at this supposed front for a money laundering operation should be held Crazy. responsible for other people's conduct. I mean, it's it's just, that's bizarre, right? Not, not our answers. It would be bizarre to hold like the man spinning pizza dough responsible for yeah. someone else's conduct. What do you think scares or concerns Congress most? Because this is something that I know with on our circles, we talk a lot about what are they so afraid of here that, that you know, innovation is going to do something that we don't already have happening right now in our current financial system. I think it's the specter of sanctioned entities. So like in the tornado cash example, it's like you just say North Korea and people yeah. are very scared and worried about money going to North Korea. And of course we share that. We're not trying to say that, you know, it's open season, but in the tornado cash case, the government is taking the completely unprecedented view that a software developer is responsible for the conduct of third parties when they didn't even have contact with the third parties. And that's really crazy, right? Like that's regulation by criminal indictment, which has very high consequences for individuals. Um, and it's just the same problem over and over again, right? We, we don't get clear rules and then, and then suddenly a person gets hit with an action they never expected. And in this case, yeah. now it's the DOJ targeting a software developer. But I yeah. think what they're afraid of is, you know, the specter of these um, sanctioned entities that we should be worried about. But this is just not the way to combat illicit finance going to sanctioned entities. Well, and it, it gets to the point where you're taking away so many rights and so many freedoms, you know, for the benefit of maybe something that will happen and not really knowing and then really kind of uh, throwing a lot of people under the bus that have no bearing on the real act of the nefarious scenario that's play, taking place. So the bad guys still start, are doing bad guys things and the good guys are going, why am I now the bad guy? You know, so yeah, exactly. you're right, exactly. Uh, speaking of a bad guy, we got to talk about Mr. Gensler. <laughs> and that of course is the uh, U.S. Uh, SEC chair now is probed by House Republicans. And where do you think this is going to go? Do you think, what, what's your opinion right now in this Gensler scenario? He's been accused of, of political preference hiring. You know, how is this going to have any bearing on what's going on with the SEC? You know, I don't know the facts well enough there to weigh in on the specifics, but I will say that Chair Gensler has a, a real uphill battle no matter what happens with this. Um, I think that there has been a real uh, magnifying glass placed on his conduct recently mm -hmm. and his choices, and rightfully so. He clearly has a bias against this industry, and that has come out in the multiple enforcement actions, the unfair targeting of industry participants. Um, and I, I, I think he deserves the scrutiny. I don't know about these facts in particular, but um, you know, when it comes to the digital asset industry, I think that he deserves to be under the magnifying glass right now. Interesting. Listen, it's going to be an interesting week as we continue to cover that. We'll probably do a hearing or a video of that, uh, that case review uh, against Mr. Gensler from the House Republicans. Uh, so we'll get that over to you. Amanda, it's been great having you on the show. We definitely have to have you come back as things uh, progress next year, maybe even the end of this year with a lot more regulatory scenarios. So thanks for coming in today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. I hope to get back to you with good news about our lawsuit. That would be There you go. That That'll would be, be great. Awesome.
Yeah. yeah thank you so well, much. If, if anything happens on that, if you feel like you guys have got a, a pretty close deal, just reach out to our producer team. We'll be happy to get you guys back on for sure. Great. Sounds good. Thanks for coming in. All right. Thank listen, you. Thanks, guys. You bet. Uh, so, guys, if you, you've not already subscribed to the channel, make sure and do that right now. Just go ahead and maybe t give us a few comments, too, because do you like these kind of interviews or an analysis of where the regulatory framework is going? Give us some insights, because even though we normally see a lot of views on those videos, we always want to get feedback from our audience. And if you're not in the Diamond Circle, that's our own private member group. It's where we do additional content weekly updates, all sorts of things that you don't get here on YouTube. So use that link down below to get access to that. And of course, follow me out there on X at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.